This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast, and uh, we are joined today by Randall, of course, Brad, and uh, Laura is here. Uh, we're missing Mike, the normal guy. Sick. Um, yeah, he's out. He's out for this week, but Laura's taking his place. Laura, are you going to be normal enough? Are you going to be able to do that? I don't know right. if I can. I well, can't I live know. up. Uh, well, you could. You could just be silent. Laura, I can sure maybe. try. Be silent, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll try. You just have a big crystal spaceship. Fill. Yeah, there you go. All right. <laughs> that I'm on board with. Yeah. I'm on the board okay. of the crystal spaceship. crystal spaceship. There you go. <laughs> cool. Right. Welcome. Again, so you know, Laura, you've been with us. Yeah, Laura's handling our social media for us. That's right. So if you got any complaints about the social media presence, take them to Laura. Uh, take them to uh, yeah, you know where the complaints department is. <laughs> yes. No, send them to Russ. No. Yeah. <laughs> Russ is our customer service. <laughs> Bad idea. Keep them to yourself. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. We love Laura. <laughs> She's doing an awesome job. Yeah, she does a great no, job. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So where are we going Try today, to Randall? What's the topic? Guys. Yep. You're doing a good job at it. Where are uh, we going? Yeah. Well, you know, I thought we'd continue kind of addressing some of the questions we raised in the last podcast about you, the efficacy you, of ice dams. Right. Okay. Well, what, where I, where I kind of interrupted and said, okay, well, that's a good question to leave for next, uh, next episode. How did all the water get all the way over here? Right. To Grand Coulee. So that was, that was kind of the end point. I remember that I was like, I, I ponder that people. Yeah. So, yep, we, we can do that and more with getting back to the glacier dam lakes. Well, we could do that. We certainly could. Um, and I think that would be an excellent idea. So I think what we'll do is we'll circle back to the beginning with Harlan Bretz, Jay Harlan, and um, some of the things that he made had to say about as he was in the early stages of figuring out the floods. And uh, this is a quote from... Uh, 1925, uh, in the Journal of Geology, uh, Bretz had an article entitled The Spokane Flood Beyond the Channel Scab Land. So for, to, to give you an idea of what beyond the Channel Scab Lands meant would be like we, went, uh, we ventured beyond the Channel Scab Lands when we, when we went on to the Rolling Palouse and went up to the top of Steptoe Butte, right? That was beyond the Channel Scab Lands. Anyways, he goes, he goes here, to, he says that um, the spoke, now he's calling it the Spokane ice sheet. Now we re generally refer to it as the Cordilleran ice sheet. Same thing. The Spokane ice sheet crossed the Columbia Valley north of the plateau and advanced a few miles out on it along almost the entire northern margin. Water from the melting of this ice flowed in the pre-glacial consequent drainage system entering at or near the head of these valleys and traversing their entire lengths. The ablation of the Spokane ice sheet must have been extraordinarily rapid for the volume of water was very great, almost incredibly great, and in spite of high gradients to draw it off, the pre-existing valleys first entered were inadequate to carry it all, and the flood spread widely in a complicated group of anastomosing routes. Okay, so you guys now know the term anastomosing. Kyle, redeem yourself. <laughs> this is your. Hey, I thought this I is had your... enough attaboys to last like two or three episodes. It's only well, been two months. <laughs> it's it's basically diverting and then reconverging streams. Yeah. What is the typical uh, term that's more of a uh, a common 
and a branching or something like that. Yeah, a branching, a branching, branching. system. Yeah, with the but that they reconverge. Yes, they split and they come back together. Yeah, and um, if I go over to, uh, let's see, let's go to, um, I'll go to Google Maps and I'll go to satellite view, and I am going to zoom in and then. Uh, let's do this. I'll share screen. And we're looking at the Cheney Palouse, right? And what we see here is what he is referring to is that you have, you see, like it splits apart here and then comes together down here. So it's a branching. You can really see it over here in the Telford Scabland tract. So also known as Anna branching. And a when, it, when it sure. comes back together. When it comes back together, yes. Thank you. Okay, so you get another, I'd say maybe a 0.25 attaboy for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so watch my watch my cursor here, and I'm going to roughly follow the outline of the Cordilleran ice sheet just prior to the onset of the flooding. So here we've got the Okanagan lobe, Grand Coulee. We come up here, and then we cross... And we kind of the 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 ice front is uh, goes to the east here, and then it lobes down a little bit right here where the Columbia River comes out, right in this area, and then it would continue over here. Now this is the valley that had the Purcell Trench lobe, and we talked about the possibility of where this lobe would have terminated, and I suggested it had terminated right in here somewhere. And the water discharging from the snout right there at that terminus is what you see right here. The, here's the, look, look right here. I'm going to zoom in. There's the head of the uh, Cheney Palouse Scabland. Check this out. Look, notice the almost sort of the Finger Lake lakes, the elongated lakes where the water is becoming channelized. And if we zoom in here, you can actually see where it begins to go down and then it starts down cutting. So it looks to me like the head of the, the erosion is right in this area, roughly at 2,400 feet above sea level. And that line follows right on over here, right over here, the head of the Telford. And you see it's named after the little town of Telford there. And then it comes over and presumably would have filled the Columbia River Valley right here with, with ice and would have terminated right in this area right here, right? Now we come over here, and, and it would have and been the Columbia, diverted. The Columbia River there is is more or less the perimeter or the northern edge of the basalt plateau. Yes, good point, Brad. Excellent point. But, right, so the basalt plateau actually has this tongue that comes north like this. So this is the northern, you see, there's this. this is the tongue of basalt right here. So this was lava. And it had managed to flow this far north, and then it terminated. Well, so then when that happened, the original route of the Columbia was not across. You see how it transects the basalt plateau here? Well, it routed this way, where Omac Lake is now, and routed around and flowed where the Okanagan River flows now, and then would have reconnected with its modern channel right here by by this town of Brewster. However, and you'll think about this, it makes sense now. The Cordier and Ice Sheet is growing and the ice is, is extending from the north over the Canadian Rockies. Well, now it's moving south. Picture this big lobe of ice, this big blob of ice is, is surging southwards. So it comes up, comes here and it over, it, it basically blocks the flow of the Columbia that's coming up this way. So what happens is the ice comes down, and at some point the ice is is before it, you can see here. This was the southernmost extent when it finally accomplished its journey. It paused right down here, and then it receded back up. Right. Well, at some point the ice had come down here, and it had choked off this circuitous route route around this tongue of of basalt. And it forced the river to flow across the basalt, which eventually downcut and created the present-day 
course of the Columbia. Of course, now when the ice continued south, uh, all the way down here to and formed the Withrow Moraine, which is this arcuate feature right here, named after the little town of Withrow, you can see that it would have come up here and most likely would have completely filled what is now Grand Coulee. So that, that was the thing, the question that we left it was, how would the water get from the outlet over here, Clark Fork River, it has to now break through an ice dam here, flow south, where, remember now, this it's presumed that this whole valley was filled with a, a glacier, the Purcell Trench Lobe, which would have terminated right around Spokane somewhere in here. I'm suggesting that maybe it came all the way up to this point right here. And then if that came down that far, and then the Okanagan came this far south over here, it seems pretty likely that the ice was also filling, the completely filling the Columbia River Valley, if not the Spokane River Valley, which is here. So in other words, at that point, there really is no Columbia River. Uh, what you would have is discharge over here, but anything up here is filled with glaciers, right? So all of this, if you look at the Columbia, which goes north up here into, into the Cordilleran region, that's all filled with ice. Well, yeah, I wanted to ask about that. Is there any way to determine if there was still a waterway there under the ice or there was just absolutely no Columbia River and it well, just I would initiated think, there south south of the glacier? No, um, I think it had to have initiated south of the glacier. Why would there have been a river under the ice if... I, yeah, I don't if, know. If there was a river, it would have been like a tunnel valley, right? And there would be, there would be definite uh, signatures for that. Yes, and what you do find, though, is evidence of, you know, the, the really what's left its final imprint on the landscape, the uppermost imprint, was the melting of the ice. So the ice comes through first, and it does its geomorphic work, erosional work, its ice, glacier ice sculpting work. Then the melting dumps a huge volume of meltwater into the valleys, which now has to flow off, and then that further modifies the landscape, and so the final overprinting that takes place on the landscape is going to be fluvial in origin. So, so what Bretz is thinking, Bretz in his first interpretation, let, let, let's go on here um, to see what he then says. Um, he says, now this is from another, this was from uh, 1928, uh, the Geographical Review. And he says, it is difficult, this is from the, uh, an article entitled The Channel Scab Land of Eastern Washington, 1928, The Geographical Review. It is difficult to convey by words and pictures a visualization of the observable relationships of Channel Scab Land. Such terms as canyon, cataract, scarp, gravel deposit, calling up images of the usual topographic forms, suggests the usual explanation, which involves far less water and far more time than the writer's hypothesis demands. Put a glacial Columbia first in one channel, then in another, then in a third, instead of running all of them at the same time, use more than one glacial episode if necessary, upwarp the transected divides, to give the present high altitudes above valley floors. Procedures such as described here are unheard of. Other ice sheets have come and gone and left no such record. How could such quantities of water be yielded from so small a front and with so little retreat? You see what he's asking there? He, he, he's seen these enormous volumes of water. And now you guys have now seen these landscapes yourself. You've seen Grand Coulee. You've seen Moses Coulee. We've seen the Scablands, the Channel, the Cheney Palouse. You've seen Palouse Falls and Devil's Canyon. And okay, so if we go back to his, Brett's uh, original idea, is he's seeing discharge emanating across the entire ice sheet, east to west. Now, this is in the 1920s. There's been no um, 
attempt to invoke a glacial lake at this point. Now, in 2001, John Shaw and um, our good buddy. With Jerome. Now, yeah, that was 99 before we took that oh, BC yes. trip. Yeah, Sorry, yeah. 99. 99. Yeah. They came out with a paper. Uh, everybody who watches Cosmographia regularly knows Jerome Lessman. He's been now made a couple of appearances uh, to teach us about drumlins and, and other large-scale fluvial events. Well, he was still a graduate student, I believe, in 99 when this paper came out that he co-authored with John Shaw. And the title of the paper was Back to Bretts, the Channel Scablands Back to Bretts. The implication there was is maybe we should go back to Bretts' original concept, which was discharge from across the entire ice sheet front that, that, that terminated on the uh, northern reaches of the Columbia Basalt Plateau, rather than a single point discharge coming from the east that would have been the discharge out of the Clark Fork River. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Because if it makes sense to you guys, then I guess it would make Pretty sense. Pretty much everybody else will get everybody it. Everybody else, right. So, uh, and, and in case people were wondering, you know, why you guys are participating in this, I mean, now you. <laughs> That's right. We're the lowest thing. common denominator. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> yeah. No, I, I'm sorry, guys. I didn't mean to insult you like that. Um, I forget, you know, I, how sensitive you guys are. I'll try to be kinder and gentler going forward here. I, I don't buy it. You're not going to do not that. Not buying it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I did mention to the guys earlier that, you know, up to this point, this podcast has been mostly PG uh, <laughs> rated, has it had a PG rating. But uh, I'm just thinking maybe we're going to ramp it up to an R rating. All right. It's just because the what's going on out there in the world culturally I tell you what, man, we won't get off on that now, but man, political correctness. And of course, as we go forward here with this mass of evidence that we're going to be uh, presenting, or we may find ourselves on the receiving end of various kinds of accusations, Absolutely. which of course will all be nonsense. But Well, and that's one of the beauties of moving to how to, we can say what we want. That's, that's right. right. Fucking A. <laughs> All right. So then, in, back to the same Geographical Review article from 1928, he says, Bretz, that is, says, it may be that there are other significant facts yet to be discovered. But the writer is convinced that the relations outlined in this paper do exist, and that no alternatives yet proposed by others or devised by himself can explain them. And what he's referring to there is all the attempts to explain these gigantic, humongous floods by reference to readily observable, gradualistic type phenomena, right? So he says that no alternatives yet proposed by others, because there were a handful that came forward and says, uh, no, I think we can explain this by, by more normal processes. Brett's himself, uh, to show the the the... the good scientist that he was, tried to come up with alternative explanations and attempted to fit the evidence into these various alternative explanations. And in the end, gave up and said, no, I just can't get away from the conclusion that we're looking at some god-awful big gigantic floods here. He says, then goes on to say that the unique assemblage of remarkable physiographic forms on the Columbia Plateau in Washington, described here as the Channel Scabland system or complex, records a unique records a unique episode in Pleistocene history. Special causes seem clearly indicated. But what these causes were is yet an unsolved problem. Okay, so he's sitting there back then. He's looking at the maps, looking across the, the ice front, arrayed across the northern sector of the Columbia P Plateau. He's seeing these Moses Cooley, Grand Cooley, Telford Scabland, Cheney Palouse Scabland, and he's looking and he's seeing what to me 
looks obvious is that these that these huge masses of glacial meltwater are emanating from the front of the ice sheet. Well, you know, he asked this question: how how could how could I'll I'll I'll, I'll read a hero it. man Harlan Brett seeing this stuff in the twenties. Oh, I know. Mind boggling and writing about it and, you know, having scoured it for weeks and weeks and look at all the maps that we've got easy access. And he was out there in some jalopy or some, you know, yeah. hiking, you know, yes. <laughs> freaking well, unbelievable. So and then, amazing. So yeah. Amazing and, that he had the vision. He could see it. And then when you look at compare his maps, hand drawn from field reconnaissance, I mean, they perfectly represent what we can now see from satellite surveys. Wow. Yep. Incredible. So jumping back to the previous quote, he ends that quote and he says, how could such quantities of water be yielded from so small a front and with so little retreat? Well, in other words, normal glacier, you're going to have the, the front, the terminus of that glacier is going to be melting back. But, you know, you're going to be producing, you know, a few tens of thousands of cubic feet per second. Typically, when, and that's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at some of the modern uh, glacier recession and even outburst floods, right? So he's going, well, to produce that much water, you know, how, how do you produce that much water with, without a massive recession of the glacier ice? Okay, well, I think that one thing that he was not envisioning was that the source of the water was not confined merely to the glacier front. It was actually coming from way back up. All right, wait. Did did I miss something? Uh, why did he? Why was he saying that there was no no noticeable retreat? Like, is there is there a reason why he was saying, well, okay, we're getting all this water, but there's no clear retreat of the ice? Well, yeah. So so okay. Let me back up to the previous sentence. He okay. says. Um, he says. Uh, he 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 play, he puts these various things. Um, you know, first the Columbia in one channel, then in another, then in a third, instead of running all of them at the same time. So he's saying, well, how would you do that? How would you sh constantly be shifting the, the, the glacial Columbia first in one channel, then in another, then in the third, back and forth, instead of running all of them at the same time? Yeah. See, instead of running them all at the same time, because that's what he's, uh, uh, he's looking at these features and thinking that they're all happening simultaneously. Right. Right. Um. Use more than one glacial episode if necessary. Well, then that introduces a whole level of complexity into the thinking. If you're looking at, well, it's not all just one glacial episode. These were multiple glacial episodes. Well, then that means that, you know, if you had one erosional feature produced by an earlier glacier, it's got to be, you know, 40, 50,000 years, 30,000 years older. Right. So then there should be a vast disparity in the ages of these channels. But he goes to great uh, length to to try to demonstrate, uh, consistent with what they could do back in the 1920s, that they were all basically of the same age. Yeah. So th or, there must have been something that he noticed that made him say there was all this meltwater coming out of the front of the ice without there being a large amount of retreat of the front. That's all I'm, I'm getting at. Yes. There must, yeah. I was he just says, wondering what that yeah, was. Yeah. Procedures such as described here are unheard of. Other yeah. ice sheets have come and gone and left no such record. How could such quantities of water be yielded from so small a front and with so so little retreat? And the answer is, well, they couldn't. Yeah. That's the point. He's asking this question and he's asking it rhetorically, but the answer to the question is no, it it couldn't. It can't. Yeah. It can't. Right. So he ends by saying special causes seem clearly indicated, but what these causes were is yet un an unsolved problem. Now, he doesn't go this far where we're saying, well, we're actually looking at volumes of meltwater that went way further back north into the glacial complex than the mere ice front, roughly at the 49th parallel. Yeah, right? basically, basically a possibility is that the source of the meltwater was not the forward edge. The southern edge of the correct, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah, and this was the the implication of the title of the Shaw, Lessman, uh, and others paper when they said the Channel Scablands back to Brett's to circle back to this idea 
that the meltwater may be emanating directly from the glacial front. Right. Not to say that there's no water coming from, you know, the standard source, which is Lake Missoula, but to say that, you know, the and filling, that's kind of, the filling and draining of Lake Missoula may have been part of the same event. Well, bear right. in mind now, it, in 1928, there's no Lake Missoula in the scenario yet. That actually doesn't show up into thinking about the Channel Scabland formation until the 1940s. Um, yeah, but the back to Brett's paper. The, idea. Yeah, Shaw and Shaw and Lesman were thinking. This yeah, be all of this about. Yeah, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Brett's clearly says then that um, uh, you know special causes seem clearly indicated. But I think this quote from Richard Waite in 1985, um, when the standard model, I'll call it the standard model, which is, okay, the challenge now is to find some modern process that we can use as an analog. So, you know, Pardee went, was the one who invoked and actually, he was he was actually resurrecting an idea first proposed by T.C. Chamberlain in the 1890s, when T.C. Chamberlain was, I think, the first one who noticed the shorelines in the basin of Lake Missoula and theorized that somewhere to the west, in the Clark Fork Valley, I believe he even theorized, there had been an ice dam. And so there had been a big lake there. Pardee picked up on that. He did the research that, you know, showed, you know, the... Um, his first, his first paper, which was published on Lake Missoula, was actually 1910, which is interesting because 1910 was the same year that Bretts first got a hold of the uh, newly published U.S. Geological Survey topographic maps that showed potholes cataract. Remember, I mentioned that. And Bretts got a hold of that topographic map and said, what the, as this. What the hell is this? And that's really what first triggered his his curiosity was that map of Potholes Cataract, right? So 1910, Brett's got a hold of that particular map, which ignited his curiosity about its formation. J.T. Pardee published his first paper on Glacial Lake Missoula. And there was also Comet Haley that came through the night sky while these guys were doing this and Mark Twain passed away under the comet. We all know that story, right? How he was born under yep, the comet and pre predict, predicted right. he would. So 1910, interesting, interesting year. Anyways. Was Pardee uh, the one that said he knew where Brett's water came from? Is that the start of that? That's right. Okay. That's exactly right. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, in, in uh, fingerprints of the gods, uh, Graham gives a really great, succinct summary of the whole history, Brett's discoveries and yeah, the magicians. controversies and so That'll on. Be, yeah, magicians. magicians of the gods. Yeah. What did I say? Fingerprints. 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 Oh, yeah, no, uh, sorry. Magicians of the gods. 2014. Yeah, 2014. Uh, yeah, so, um, so then... As it comes forward, the next step was was Vic Baker's work in the early seventies. He he came in and did the paleohydrological analysis up there in the Spokane Valley, which is remember where we went next to the railroad tracks. It was kind of flat and open and kind of boring, not too interesting. But the interesting thing about it was that that was a major conduit for meltwater. I think coming from two sources: the Purcell Trench and the Clark Fork river so let me let me uh go to the share screen and we'll look at the map and i will show everybody where we're talking about where where we were we went up in the spokane valley come into focus here guys right up we were uh right, right on the state line there that, yeah right here right on the state is yeah. right on the state line yeah. yeah there we were right on the state line so we were out in this kind of flat area, but what I wanted everybody to, to appreciate was that this was a major sluiceway. And this is in this area here is where uh, Baker did his hydrological analysis. 
And by using what's called the step backwater method, by knowing the gradient and the high water mark and taking tra multiple transects, he was able to uh, calculate that the peak discharge uh, through this valley was close to 800 million cubic feet per second, possibly 700 to 800 million cubic feet per second. And if we go north of here, see, this is another interesting part E coming north. Water would have been coming, the main, the main flow of water would have been coming through this, this trough that is now occupied by Lake Pend Oreille. Pardee did his uh, peak discharge calculations in Eddy Narrows, which is this, for hydrological purposes, this is, this is a, a, a great place to do it because it's a relatively straight reach and you can get the gradient from here to here. And what you're looking for when you're doing a hydrological analysis, you're looking for a, something where you've got um, basically the same geometric, the same geometry consistent over a, a, some given reach of the of the water flow. You see here it gets complicated because you see, look right here, it opens out from the river into a basin. So this would have actually been, and you can see here, this is this would have been a depositional basin right here. And this would have been an erosional reach. And actually, if you zoom in, the erosion is clearly apparent on the hillsides. You see all of this? This is, look at this here. This is all, the water has eroded this, the water flowing from right to left. Look at here. You see, look at this streamlined form right here, left over and over here. The base, basically the water scoured off the smooth sides of the hill that would have been pre-flood and left these deeply uh, scoured uh, truncated hills like you see right here. And, so and then hanging valleys, didn't we see hanging valleys in there too? Uh, well, yeah, they're not as apparent. Like here's a, a tributary coming in this yeah. way. So this was probably filled with ice. All right. Um, and the ice terminated. Yeah, look look at the streamlined islands and stuff. Look at this. Mantling the valley floor. So clearly there was major flows of water coming from southeast towards the northwest as you come through the valley here. And then when you get to, let's see, there's Thompson Falls. I'll zoom out. And when you get up here right to about to the state line, Idaho Montana state line is where somewhere in here is where the ice dam supposedly terminated. But where exactly? I don't think that see because there's no moraine there to speak of. I wonder if that that gorge where the dam is was actually a, a subglacial outlet for some outburst and and you know forced its way through and created that gorge right there. Right here, sure. Where the dam is. Yeah, the dam is, let's see, that's a bridge. Let's go back here. The dam is right here. So they basically say that the dam was somewhere, you know, in this area. There's an overlook here. And on our next trip, when we start going to the, uh, when, we, when we do the, uh, the, the eastern sector, when we go into the lake basin, I think we would yeah, probably... Hard try to come through this because oh, yeah. you know we on this last trip we got up here to spokane that's how far we got on the next trip it would be cool if we could get from pick up some from there say and then travel east into the lake basin and, and explore all of this area um anyways back to brett's i mean to pardee's calculations let's go when you're talking hundreds of millions of cubic feet per second, I mean, that's pretty much impossible for most people to even wrap their heads around. What does that even mean? I like to think of it in terms of cubic miles. So uh, Baker calculated that it was about 17 cubic miles per hour of water coming okay. through here. Maybe 18, somewhere in there. Yeah, I just I just ran it. You said 800 million cubic feet uh. per second. Yeah. And I did a conversion of that to cubic miles and then multiplied it by 60 twice, and I got 19.5 cubic miles per hour. Okay. that So, yeah. Okay. So I, I was being a little more conservative. Yeah, but, yeah. 
Six, yeah, but, 16 to, to 18 would be, yeah. But if it was yes. 800 million cubic feet per second, if Google is right on the, on the, <laughs> you know, on the conversion to cubic miles. If you, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's about right. Yeah. But you see, Pardee's calculation down here in Eddie Narrows was about nine and a half cubic miles per hour. Okay. So that's a pretty major discrepancy. Now, oh, and, and zoom in there on uh, Rathdrum Prairie there, Randall, because you're saying that uh, Baker's calculations are going through through the Spokane Valley, right? Yeah, but, that's, but, th but that's look, the one I was talking about. Yeah. But yeah, look going into Lake Coeur d'Alene. I mean, that's that's not even considered. Right. You know, the trough that would have been through Lake Coeur d'Alene and, and that could have uh, uh, outflowed right over across the, the Palouse Hills. Well, yeah, out, out that southern end would have would have been the flow that would have created those uh those those crazy less hills there that we saw from Steptoe Butte. Ah, yeah, actually, uh, Baker's calculations were in Rathdrum Prairie, so they would have they would have included included. In, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So so I need to correct that a little bit because there would have been a, a, a some flow diverted that that cut this trough that's now occupied by. Um, Lake Coeur d'Alene. Yeah, Coeur d'Alene, yeah. Um, okay, okay. But yeah, so, but back to them, to the point, which was that, you know, not quite double, but almost double um, disparity, a factor of two disparity between Baker's uh, calculations in the early 70s and Pardee's calculations in the 40s. So why the discrepancy? Well, for one thing, uh, Party used a simpler formula, just uh, the Chesi formula, it's called, which is uh, less sophisticated. I won't get into it, really, the differences, other than to say that um, Victor Baker used a more sophisticated formula. The step backwater method um, was, a, was a more accurate determination. However, there's a big however here, the discrepancy between the two procedures used between Party and Baker is not so great that they would be different by a factor of two. You know, in other words, Baker's more accurate may, may make it 10% or 15% more accurate, but it's not going to complete because yeah. if, if it was a factor of two different, then that means that this formula that Pardee used, which is one that's been used by hydraulic, hydraulic engineers for a century, doesn't work. Right. I see. Yeah. Okay. So what's the explanation for that discrepancy? And I think it's it's very clear is that what Baker was was measuring was the flow coming from Clark Fork combined with the flow coming through Purcell Trench. Right. It can't have just been Clark Fork, basically. Right. right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Augmented. So, so getting back to what Bretz was saying, uh, you know, when he said that um, special causes seem clearly indicated. What happened was, is after Baker did his work, then Richard Waite came along and studied the rhythmites in Burlingame Canyon, uh, I think maybe at Nine Mile Creek and at uh, Lata Creek, and concluded that they were all emplaced by separate floods. And so that each layer within uh, the Burlingame Canyon was produced by a separate flood, and each flood was produced by a separate damming of Lake Missoula. And so now the process gets extended out. Um, all of the erosion of the Channel Scablands is now interpreted as coming from Lake Missoula. Lake Missoula then is behind a ice dam. The problem, though, is is you cannot explain. The, the, the vast complexity of the Channel Scablands by recourse to a single flood emanating from a single point, which is the Clark Fork, the mouth of the Clark Fork River, just east of Pond Array. So then that idea fit in with the, uh, the idea that um, there had been multiple floods and they had been a, a, a long sequence and each flood was routed differently depending upon the configuration of the glacial ice. And so there have been two stu several studies now using um, 
OSL dating and magnetic geomagnetic dating, which seem to suggest that the that the number of flood or that the duration of the floods was over three thousand years, say, which is now being interpreted as supporting the idea that there was a minimum of forty separate floods with forty separate dammings of Lake Missoula, and so. As, as Graham pointed out in Magicians of the Gods, it seemed like they were in a big hurry to try to look for more prosaic and mundane explanations that didn't require what Bretz was referring to, you know, when he said special causes seem clearly indicated. They didn't want to have to deal with special c- causes. Right. So... And that's kind of captured, I think, in this in this next quote here by Richard Waite in 1985. This is what he says in the uh, Geological Society of America Bulletin. And don't get me wrong now, I have the greatest respect for the work that Richard Waite has done. And he, more than just about anybody else, has helped to keep uh, the whole story of the floods alive. Okay, so I'm going to give him credit for that. And he, he knows his geology, but I think in some areas he's maybe... Uh, you know, I have to say, I think he's misinterpreted the the rhythmites. But he says here, and this kind of captures the mindset, there is neither field evidence nor theoretical reason that the huge glacial Lake Missoula, whose outlet was via the ice dam, should have behaved radically different from small ice dammed lakes. Really? Right? There's neither field evidence nor theoretical reason that the huge glacial of Lake Missoula, whose outlet was via the ice dam, should have behaved radically different from small ice dammed lakes, meaning ice dammed lakes such as we have witnessed and see today. He thinks there's no field evidence for that? Spoken like a true uniformitarian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There we go. He's the one that he's the one that identified the the ash layer there in Burlingame Gulch. So yeah, you mentioned that a minute ago. I was wanting you to point it out on your map before it went away. But uh, yeah, if you bring that back up, you can see how you know diverse the locations of those are that they're trying to link those together. The Nine Mile Creek and the Burlingame Canyons. You know. 200, 300 miles away from each other. Well, let's just do this. Okay. Um, Burlingame is down here in the Walla Walla Valley. We need to see it. Yeah. Uh, Oh, you have to see it. It's always something, isn't it? Well, we get to watch the dog right now, though, so that's okay. Yeah, the dog's back there. It's great. (laughs) 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 Oh, Oh, Bella. (laughs) <laughs> she's the worst one about ha- having to get in here when whenever yeah. i'm pod i don't know what Hi. it is it's hilarious it's your biggest fan <laughs> yeah she's your biggest there. fan <laughs> oh okay so let me zoom out columbia basalt plateau everybody now has heard of Walula gap right here never well, seen it oh man i but got yeah, some I've good drone video oh, i just looked at oh. it yesterday i got some great drone video down there Oh yeah, well, we need we need to see it next yep. next episode. Okay, so this was a huge back flood valley right here. I will also mention something while we're here. Now, oh, right down in here, I can't find it necessarily right on this map, but all of this whole valley is filled with thick layers of back flood sediment, and since it's only you know thirteen fourteen thousand years old in that range, it hasn't lithified into rock. So it's it's pretty it's soft. It's all being farmed right now, but it, again, it's several hundred feet minimum of this layered rhythmical sediment. And uh, so Burlingame Gulch, in fact, let's see, do I have uh, might have it handy here, um, and I could show you a picture of what we're talking about. Okay. Yeah, good. these are. This is. I love this yeah. picture. Yeah. yeah. Like see this spot. Rhythmical layers called rhythmites, and there's roughly I think 39 visible here. 
So basically the theory is, is that each one of these layers represents a separate draining of Lake Missoula, which then in turn implies that there was a separate damming of the Clark Fork River Valley. And then you had an outburst flood, the dam failed, the lake drained, and all of that water came down to, okay, so here's another interesting point. The Wallula Gap here across the, the, the basalt bedrock from one side to the other is between 1,000 and 1,200 feet. Uh, the east side here, I mean, the west side is maybe 100, couple hundred feet higher in elevation than the east side because there's an upwarp in here, but it's about a mile across. The discharge capacity has been calculated to be about, guess what, 300 to 400 million cubic feet per second which is about the same as the discharge capacity of the Part E calculated for the Clark Fork River. Now, here's what I want you to think about. Okay, so if you had, let's say, nine and a half cubic miles discharging from here, well, then once you get down here to Wallula Gap, you've got this span, this distance here, which is probably going to be close to 180 miles from the discharge point down to here. Well, in other words, the flow through Clark Fork Valley is the same roughly as the flow through Wallula Gap. So here's the, here's the point. If, if, if the flow fl flowing into this basin, which we'll call, look here, this whole thing is called Pasco Basin, right? And how much water would have to be flowing into Pasco Basin such that the water back floods over a thousand feet deep? In other words, the water ponded here. In fact, we're standing in, in uh, some of the videos that we've got. Brad and Graham and Santa and I are standing up on this rim looking out across the gap. And we're right there, though I forget exactly, 11 to 1,200 feet up. And we're standing right on the, where the peak of the water rose to. Well, think about this. If the flow of water coming from the north is, is nine, out of Clark Fork, let's say is 9.5 9 cubic miles per hour, the discharge capacity of Wallula Gap is 9.5 cubic miles per hour, there should be no ponding. It should just basically flow straight through. In other words, whatever is flowing into the northern area of Pasco Basin is so much greater than what's flowing out of Pasco Basin through Wallula Gap that it still ponds and forms a huge inland sea a thousand feet deep. So now we have to go back to, to Baker's calculation and go, okay, well, what is the flood surge? If it's if we go up here to Rathdrum Prairie and it's, say, 18 cubic miles per hour. Well, as it's flowing across the basalt plateau, it's going to be losing energy, isn't it? I mean, just think of this. Take, fill up a five-gallon yeah. bucket of water, go out and tip it over, and immediately you got a big rush of water, and as it's spreading out, what is it doing? Slowing it's slowing down. down. It's dissipating. The, yeah. the, 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 the force, the hydraulic force is ameliorating. So the question becomes, how much does it ameliorate between here and here? Well, it has to ameliorate enough that, or it doesn't ameliorate enough that there's no ponding behind Wallula Gap. So in other words, there's an implication here. The implication, I think, is that you have to consider that there are multiple sources of inflow to Pasco Basin. Otherwise, there's not going to be any any flooding. There's not going to be any ponding. There's not going to be any back flooding. Look, over here is the Yakima Valley. This whole Yakima Valley was back flooded, hundreds of feet deep. So you had to have so much water coming in, and the only inlet to this Yakima Valley is right through here by Richland. So it comes through here, and you've got this entire valley filled with water, back flooding, and then it drains off. So Again, here's my point. Is this consistent with a single discharge from the Clark Fork? Doesn't seem like it. Doesn't seem like it, no. Right. And on that note, let's take a little break. All right. Good. We'll be right back. Yep. 
with fewer dogs. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're back. And uh, it's been a late night for us here, so we're probably going to have a little bit shorter episode, maybe. We'll see where it goes. But before we get back into the material, I want to talk about CBD from the Gods again. Um, check them out online, cbdfromthegods.com. And uh, look at all their products, and uh, there's some good literature in there about the company and what they do. And, and uh, you can, if you order something, put in the promo code RC Ships Free, you get free shipping. And that helps us out, um, you know, to further the goals of this entire endeavor. So thanks to everybody who's done that. And uh, Randall, do you have something to report on? Well, no, just CBD? other than I found it a very uh, was a very good thing to have with on these field trips uh, last month because I was um, number one. Uh, you know, we were up there scouring Eastern Washington, the scab lands, and then a few weeks later, I'm down there in the. Uh, Arizona and Utah, um, looking at all the archaeological sites and geological sites down there. Um, so, you know, a lot of traveling, and I tell you, it really does help me get to sleep and sleep soundly. Because um, you know, I'm, I'm a regular, fairly light sleeper. So it, it uh, you know, really helps me get into that deep, restful sleep when I'm out traveling. The other thing was that I noticed, you know, from the hiking and the carrying in the backpack and so on, I got a little chafing and it was getting uncomfortable. And I applied some, and so, well, I don't, you know, because I actually, um, you know, the salve, I didn't have the salve with me. I only had the oil, this, this stuff right here. I only had the oil. But, well, I'll try putting some oil on it and on, on the chafing where it was kind of starting to rub raw. And I'll be darned if it didn't within the next day, it was fine. So I was pretty impressed by that. So, yeah. Because yeah. after uses. new uses, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. How about now, I imagine yeah, this, one of the sad would be even better, probably. Probably. Yeah. Cause it has other ingredients in it, but so yeah, Laura, I, Laura oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I had, I had some extra and I gave it to you. You were having foot issues and you got to use that some too, right? Yeah. It worked good on my, on my ankle. I mean, I had, you know, I think I broke something in there, so it was pretty, it was pretty deep, but for the healing of like the whole, you know, after effect, it was totally, um, any soreness uh, was good to put it on at the end of the day, especially, yeah, after all this stuff. And I went on all the trips with my broken ankle. So. Yeah, you weren't holding back. You were out there <laughs> hoofing it. Yeah, so so that helped. Good, yeah, good to hear. Yeah, absolutely. But we're not saying that it heals broken bones. Right. <laughs> what we're saying, though, is though <laughs> it will help to alleviate the pain associated with injuries. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that seems sure. to be a common a common uh, effect. Yeah. Yep. People with arthritis and other, you know, joint problems even just um, seems to help with the pain, inflammation, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So. And I'll say, I really, I wasn't expecting the salve to be as uh, natural and um, nice as it is. It's really a nice, uh, mm -hmm. you know, mild sort of floral. I don't want to say floral, but. It's like an, it's like a really nice, uh, <laughs> easy going the, style. It's just, yeah, easy like going. Some of the sports laid. dreams, the Ben Gays or whatever, are pretty, pretty. I don't, pungent. yeah, I don't like when they add a lot, right. add too much stuff to it. So it's like yeah, a really yeah. nice, um, natural thing still. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah, and, and, and I, w I will say I'm, I'm still using the gummies fairly regularly and, uh, yeah, I've been doing some stressful stuff here with the, family dealings and house sales and, uh, you know, the, the stresses, the travels and all that's going on. And, uh, it, you know, it, it really is a, you know, a peaceful, easy feeling that goes along when you take those, if you got to chill out. Hey, that would be kind of a, that's a great idea for a Ooh, song, for a song title or something. <laughs> I, yeah. was work, I was working one up. You guys think so? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Hey, the theme song for CBD oil from the gods. <laughs> We've got it. All yeah. right. So, yeah, CBD oil from the gods. Check it out, folks. We've been experimenting for months now, and so far we're liking it. I'm liking it. So that's right. CBDfromthegods.com, right? Kyle, yep. you, you know you know that. And then the uh, uh, RC Ships Free 
get you some free shipping. That, that always helps too. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. So where we left it off was this quote from Richard Wade. I'll read it once again. There is neither field evidence nor theoretical reason that the huge glacial Lake Missoula, whose outlet was via the ice dam, should have behaved radically different from small ice dammed lakes. And then, um, yeah, so that's a, a question worth asking, um, whether or not we can extrapolate upwards uh, with impunity. Let's see, uh, that same year, G.K.C. Clark published an article in Quaternary Research entitled Outburst Floods from Glacial Lake Missoula. And he makes this point. Glacial Lake Missoula differs, differs from most of the ice-dammed lakes so far investigated in several respects. The water volume is three orders of magnitude greater than for any modern ice-dammed lake. And the ratio of water volume to reservoir depth is much greater than for those of modern lakes. A major extrapolation of data from present experience is thus called for. So we have two conflicting views here. One, where he's saying, well, you know, uh, there's no reason, no theoretical reason that the huge glacial Lake Missoula should behave any different than what we see going on around us today. Well, then G.K.C. Clark points out that, uh, well, wait a second now, that's three orders of magnitude greater. Well, that's a thousand times greater. And then he makes the point that a major extrapolation of data from present experience is thus called for. Um, and then we have a paper jumping forward five years. This was in the Glacial Lake Missoula and the Channel Scabland Field Trip Guidebook for 1989 by Eugene Kiver and Dale Stradling. And Brad, yeah, we've actually been out on field trips with those guys. Yes, definitely. Yeah. A couple of them. A couple of them. And this is what they say in the Channel Scabland Glacial Lake Missoula Field Trip Guidebook. An alternative view to the role of models in predicting Yokelaup phenomena is presented by Costa in 1988. In summarizing the diversity of modern data, Costa concludes, the phenomena are more complex than can be easily analyzed, and therefore the models are not very reliable. In other words, models that are based upon upward extrapolations of modern outburst floods. He's pointing out that those models are not very reliable because that the phenomena of these gigantic glacial floods is more complicated, complex than can be easily analyzed. A survey of the database indicates modern ice dammed lakes with volumes between 10 to the 6th and 10 to the 10th cubic meters and peak outflow discharges between 10 to the second and 10 to the fourth cubic meters per second. So that would be 10 to the second is 100 cubic meters per second. 10 to the fourth is 10,000 cubic meters per, uh, per second, right? So he's looking, he's saying both the volume of modern ice dammed lakes and the peak outflow of modern ice dammed lakes compared to Lake Missoula. He says the volume of Lake Missoula at its peak was 2.5 times 10 to the 12th cubic meters, which works out to be over 600 cubic miles. And then he says, this requires an immense, he uses the word an immense, they, they use the word immense extrapolation from modern experience. So the upshot of this is that can we just, with impunity, go, well, we're going to look at a modern ice-dammed lake 
And we'll just ratchet it up by a thousand times or more to explain the channel scab lands. I think that that would be uh, warrant a measure of skepticism. Now, yeah, it, it, it's like the first thing, the first problem you have is materials failure, right? Mm hmm. And you've, you've talked about this. You've touched on this. Can the ice hold that much water? You know, well, the, the head pressure. Well, that's can, that's where we're going. That's exactly can concrete going. hold that much water. Right. Yeah. I, I, you, know. I, you know, we we come across this and I don't want to divert too far here, but we come across this also in our in our show, looking at people, ancient people's moving heavy loads, like large mm -hmm. amounts of material all at once. And somebody will do it with a one ton block and say that they could just extrapolate that up to a hundred ton block and use the same techniques. And it doesn't work because you have you end up with material failures on the things you were using. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah, th those those wooden logs that can move a one ton block will crush under a, a yeah. 200 ton block or whatever. Yeah. Right. Okay. So then just prior to mine and Brad's first excursion across the Scablands, maybe a year or two before we did in 1998, I contacted uh, a geologist up in Calgary by the name of C. Warren Hunt and talked to him about uh, a couple of articles he had written that were pretty much ignored. Um, they were published in the Bulletin of Canadian Petroleum Geology, so it was not a, a very specialist journal, so it was not being widely read, probably not even by the geological community. But C. Warren Hunt, who has passed away since then, um, he was an engineering geologist. So basically, he would be uh, the, the kind of geologist you would call in to consult with if you were looking at a specific reach of a river valley where you wanted to put a, a dam and he would come in and he would be able to look at the bedrock and the topography and determine the extent of the reservoir and the pressures and all that and tell you well no this this is weak shale here it would would not make a dam would not be suitable for a dam 300 feet high you know um or whatever that was that was the kind of geologist he was he was a consulting geologist right so I think that his words need to be considered well because he was the outlier. And as, as, as the models are developing and the effort is being made, because remember now, when, when the geological community first started accepting the reality of these floods in the 1940s, but more so in the 50s and 60s, uniformitarianism was still totally entrenched. That was the dominant point of view. So the whole mindset was how do we take this phenomena and fit it within the uniformitarian framework? And what we saw, in the, say, exemplified in the, in the Richard Waite quote, was the idea that, well, there's no empirical field evidence or theoretical reason why we can't just do that. And I, and I would say that, it, that 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 requires a little skepticism. I'm, I'm not convinced that we can just do that that we can extrapolate up by a thousand times. So anyways, on that note, let's go. Here's what C. Warren Hunt said back in 1977. The writer's examination of the Scablands area supports Bretz's view that recent catastrophic water flow has occurred. He confirms Bretz's report of a Lochthanus granite fragments and their emplacement by movement upstream. Now, Back up, let's define the term allochthonous. That means that it was transported from its place of origin, right? Allochthonous. You might look that up, Kyle, and give us the precise geological definition, A-L-L-O-C-H-T-H, allochthonous. But basically it means that the, that the granite fragments to which he's referring were transported from their place of origin. So the writer, C. Warren Hunt, he says he confirms Bretz's report of a Loch Ness granite fragments and their emplacement by movement upstream into creeks tributary to the flooded scab lands. So again, this is that same idea that we've talked about, that you have tributaries coming into the main valley. The water flow in the main valley is so, so great, it overwhelms the main valley and backfloods into the tributaries. 
So now he's saying is that you find rock types in this particular case, and I think he's probably referring here to the granite that was uh, flushed out of Canada, out of the Canadian Rockies, right? So this is the term allochthonous, that it's trans indigenous. Not indigenous. Sure, exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, not indigenous. It was it was transported from somewhere else. And then the, these back floods carried this material up into these tributary valleys where it can now be found. But this material did not originate in the valleys where it is now found. Okay, so he's he's pointing out that, you know, he's 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 verifying some of uh Brett's work. He says he confirms Brett's report of allochthonous granite fragments and their emplacement by movement upstream into creeks tributary to the flooded scablands. He acknowledges the silt mantle as described. Silt, again, as you, you know, uh, when we just saw the pictures of the rhythmites in Burlingame Canyon, those are silt layers. That, that would be a silt mantle that is covering the floor of the Yakima Valley of the uh, uh, of, of Pasco Basin, basically of of um, the Walla Walla Valley, where the uh, where the Burlingame gulches, and that's where the rhythmites are exposed. So he says he supports the view that there was recent catastrophic water flow. He supports the view that there were uh, and confirms that there was a lot of this granite fragments emplaced into upstream tributary valleys. He. Uh, confirms that there is a silt mantle, a, a, a vast widespread silt mantle. He agrees with all that. But then he says, he, meaning he's talking about himself here in the second person, he rejects the suggestion that ice might have dammed Clark Fork so as to impound water to a depth of 2,100 feet. Having asserted in his study of Lake Calgary the 1,200 feet of water depth held in by an ice dam is an impossibility. He must emphatically reiterate that assertion in the case of Lake Missoula. When one considers that modern engineering employs bedrock grouting, now do we know what bedrock grouting is? Um, nope, nope. Sounds self-explanatory. Well, prior to the building of any dam that's going to have a reservoir of any significant depth with the associated pressures at the heel of the ice dam, you want to make sure that there's not a single pore or aperture for that water to gain access to. Because what happens is, is you may even have a very small conduit. And the water flowing through there is going to be forced through because of the rising water against the damming the dam. As the water rises, pressure increases. As the pressure increases, it begins to force the water through smaller apertures. But once that water begins flowing through, it starts out slowly eroding the walls of the, of the conduit, right? Slowly. But see, here's the thing. There's a threshold that's breached where a slow linear erosion becomes catastrophic, you see. Now, bedrock grouting, what that does is they go in there and they use high-pressure hoses and they inject like this slurry into the bedrock so that they fill every crack, every fracture, every joint, every hole, every conduit within that bedrock so that there's no place for the water to gain access to any conduit that would allow it to eventually, um, you know, flow through and discharge below the ice dam. That's the whole point of bedrock grouting, right? So what, what, what um, Warren Hunt is saying here is that when one considers that modern engineering employs bedrock grouting for securing footings of 500-foot dams, it must surely strike any reader as virtually frivolous to suggest that chance emplacement of glacial ice might have dammed Clark Fork across a seven-mile span lacking in intermediate abutments and then 
retained water at four times the pressure of modern engineered concrete dams. Oh, yeah. Now, he raised that point back in 1977, and I think it's been pretty much ignored since then. But I think that that is a fatal flaw right there. That once you begin to look at glacial ice as a mechanism for retaining reservoirs of water to any kinds of depths that would approach, you know, the theoretical depth of Lake Missoula, the more you look at it, the more it seems that that becomes entirely implausible. And to that end, you know, what I want, I think we will do is we will actually look at modern examples of ice dammed lakes and what happens when they fail. Well, let me, if, before you start sharing the screen, I do have, I do have the Clark Fork Valley uh, on the image behind me and that's Lake Pend Oreille in the distance. So if you can imagine this whole expanse filled with ice and having to block back, hold back water 2000 feet. So you can see this is, this is the, actually the, the little burg of Clark Fork down here and the Clark Fork river down here. So this, this all would have been needed to be packed, filled with ice. Um, this is actually a drone image, but, you know, it's just the, the scale of it is mind boggling. You just, it's, it, it just totally seems like he said an impossibility for, for ice to, to be that, that uh, kind of so, solid barrier to, to water 2000 feet deep. Yeah. And when we look at actually, when we start looking at the architecture of glacial ice, I don't think we're going to find anything that confirms the possibility that it was a suitable material for holding water back at those kind of pressures. Um, and and you have mentioned, uh, you know, Graham Hancock's book, Magicians of the God. So he does reference, uh, he does tell a little bit of that story about C. Warren Hunt. And that was totally because you introduced uh, that to him. And, uh, I have the audio of us driving in the van uh, through uh, from from Grand Coulee over to Moses Coulee and down into Moses Coulee for, you know, about a half hour when you were, you know, just spontaneously introducing that to him. And it's excellent. And I'm, I'm going to inquire if he'll let me put that out because it's really, a, you know, a good thorough discussion of, of C. Warren Hunt's perspective. Yes. So. I think I will do a share screen here. Um, All right. And I'd, I'd just like to mention that it seemed to me that that guy was also saying that even if the ice was structurally sound enough to hold back that much, it was it's the bedrock ice interface that's another problem. Like, even if the ice could, could withstand the pressure, without bedrock grouting and filling in all those holes, you still, the water would get through somehow. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. It, it has to be so cold for the ice to lock on to the bedrock. Yeah. It's not likely that you're going to have liquid water right next to it. And also if you, if you filled the Valley with snowfall, in other words, it didn't start out as liquid that could permeate the cracks and apertures and then freeze and thereby seal them. If it's, if yeah. it's filling in by the glacier, either rolling down, you know, being, being pushed down from snowfall on the top, then you're doing more to fracture the bedrock and create apertures mm-hmm. yep. underneath the glacier than you are Filling sealing in. them in. Yeah. With, right. You know, bedrock grouting. So, yeah. Good All point. right. So, we'll do a quick share screen here. Okay. So, here, here's a topographic map of the region of the ice dam. Um, here's the mouth of Clark Fork. Is it? it enters into Lake Pend Oreille. And I've I've done two transects here. You can see the two red dashed lines. One is still where there is a a fairly narrow valley. And then I did another one right here where the valley widens out. And then I put a, 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 a line, a topographic line or an elevation line at 4,200 feet above sea level, which was the high water mark within the whole basin of Missoula, say the Missoula Basin, uh, that was the high water mark at 4,200 feet above sea level. Okay. So as it says here, this is the lower Clark Fork River Valley in the eastern part of Lake Pend Oreille. The ice dam is presumed to have been a sublobe 
of the glacier filling the area of Lake Ponderé up here, Purcell Trench Lobe, sublobe coming down this way and extending up the Clark Fork approximately to the dashed lines. The exact position of the terminus has not been identified. The two section profiles are shown in the next four slides. So we'll go, first we'll look at this one here. And here's the cross section of the valley, the Clark Fork Valley. If you look right up here, here's the, here's the little marker at 4,200 feet above sea level, right? Northeast to southwest transect at the western entrance to Cabinet Gorge, about eight and a half miles east of the Montana-Idaho state line, approximate location of the ice dam. Okay, so there's we'll put in the water level. Now, the valley floor, if you look down here at the lowest part right here, the, the modern river is flowing right here in this lowest part. If we come across here, you'll see that it's just at 2,200 feet above sea level. So basically, you're saying that the water here is 2,000 feet deep. So to try to give some sense of scale, I've used the cross-section of the city of Atlanta, but any major uh, downtown area will suffice to, to create the impression. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. Uh, Empire State Building. So, yeah, Empire State Building. And so here at the... It, plus feet high. Yeah, yeah. So here's the Clark Fork section in the in the basin. Again, I've I've got the the, the water level at four thousand two hundred feet above sea level. This is about three miles west of Cabinet Gorge profile shown in the previous slide, and now I'm going to put the skyline of Atlanta in there for scale. Now, anybody who can see any major metropolitan area, downtown area in wouldn't matter. This could be any city. It could be New York. It could be Boston, Philadelphia, Chicago, Detroit, Minneapolis, you know, Seattle, L.A. I did one like this uh, showing L.A., the, uh, the skyline of L.A. put in there when I did one of the Joe Rogan shows. I think I showed it on there. Anyways, so this is the wa volume of water that's supposed to be held in by glacial ice. Is this feasible in any stretch of the imagination? Can't see it. Right. And so the other question that's raised in my mind is that this trough here is 1,100 feet deep. Okay, so where did that come into play? You know, so you've got, if, if, if you have an ice dam here, the lake back, let's just say one time, let's, let's conjecture here. First, first filling of lake, 4,200 feet above sea level. It's 2,000 feet deep at the ice interface, the glacier interface. Finally, the ice can't hold it back anymore. It gives way, and all of this water, nine and a half cubic miles per hour, rushes out of the Clark Fork down here. Does it, at that point, then scour that trough 1,100 feet deep, or is, the, is there already, a, is, this, is the trough already there, but it's filled with glacial ice? See, I, I, I've never seen anyone actually attempting to fit the formation of Lake Ponderé into the models. The ice dam would be more believable if the whole thing were full of ice 1,100 feet down, because then it's got a solid anchor. You know, it's like, and then the water is being see, dammed up against it, but it's... Well, yeah, but that creates problems of its own, too, because yeah. now you've got now you've got to add 1,100 feet to the hydraulic head. Because now, is it solid ice all the way through That's here? what I mean. That's what would make it more believable that it could actually act as the dam, as if it was just completely solid all the way down. But, I mean, how do you, how do you break that? Yeah. Yeah, but now let's think about that. If it's solid ice all the way down, and it has to be obviously completely frozen to the bottom. I mean, it can't be How basal. are you having a liquid lake next to it? That's... Yeah. And now, yeah, you've got this massive amount of liquid water right next to it. See, this is where we get into the, the, the paradox here of the, of the whole thing. Um, well, and, and, and what they say, I forget the name of the ridge right there, just below your cursor on that south side of the... the right here. Yeah, yeah, right there. They say that the lobe, you know, pushed into that 
and it kept pressing into that and it's fairly steep. So that was, that was why it was able to withhold, withstand the water because it kept pressing into that steep face and that was able to make a seal. Okay. But now if but, we assume, yeah, yeah. yeah Again, okay. If it's 1100 feet deep right there. Yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole new story. Yeah. Now what I've seen, and I don't have that reference in front of me, but it's one of these slides. I have the, the showing modeling the formation of the lake based upon doubling the flow of the modern Clark Fork River. Well, okay, if we double the, the flow of the Clark Fork River, see, uh, now you figure waters, that water is going to be moving at 10 to 20 miles an hour, say. That's going to be probably a realistic somewhere in there. How fast is this glacial ice moving? You know, so if you've got glacial ice extending down to Purcell Trench, like what Brad said, pushing up against the mountains here, and then it's basically the idea is now it's sealing off. But we have to presume that this water is is flowing through here, flowing somewhere. I mean, if you've got double the flow of the Clark Fork River, where's it going? I mean, the, the modern outlet of Lake Ponderay is the river over here. Or actually, this is the uh, this is the Ponderay River over here. So you got an outlet to the west. So was, does that mean that the water flowing in Clark Fork was double? But see, the assumption then is that for the ponding, it had the, the, the valley had to be blocked already, right? But now if the ice dam gives way, then we presume that if, if nine and a half cubic miles or more of water is coming through here, there's no ice dam left. The ice dam has been completely flushed out. So now you have to reseal the valley. So you have to bring this ice low back down. What's the Clark Fork River doing? Well, if you're going to allow whatever 50 years or more for the basin to fill, you double the, the flow of the Clark Fork River, right? So that's going to be a pretty vigorous river. And here's the problem in my mind is that, again, let's suppose there's a, there's a basin already here. Well, that means that this river is flowing into a lake. Now, the ice, the, the ice lobe is coming down, and it's hitting this lake. So what happens then? It's going to float on it. Is, presumably, it's going to float. It's going to calve off icebergs. But how is that going to seal the valley? Yeah, I don't it, it, the other you know. Thing that, the other thing that makes no sense is even if you can – Let's say take for granted that there was an ice dam the first time. Once it's been breached, how do you have simultaneously the advancement of the ice and the filling of the lake happening? Yeah. Yeah. How do you have that? Because where's the water You're coming that's filling the lake? Yeah. And, and if, if the lake is filling, how is the dam freezing while there's a liquid? It just, I don't know. It's, that's really... Well, see, Kyle, what you're doing is great because this, this is what I'm trying to get you guys to do is, is to think through the specifics and the nuances of this whole thing. And as you do that, I think it becomes more apparent that things just aren't adding up. But now let's get back to Brett's idea that there was a, a discharge across the full front of the ice sheet. Well, if you look at it again, if we look at the at – the, uh, let me – let me go back here to just just for reference while you're doing that. It looks like it's the Green Monarch Mountains or Green Monarch Ridge, something. Oh, Green okay. Monarch. Yeah. And what is Lake Pend O'Reilly? <laughs> Lake Ponderay. Yes. I know. <laughs> Pend O'Reilly. Or or ill or ill. So yeah, it was, uh, uh, yeah took took on some uh, uh, from from the mining. You know, it was kind of poisonous. Or or ill, hmm. pond, pond really? of ill or. I'm yeah. not sure about that explanation. That sounds <laughs> pretty. Uh... I'll buy it, Brad. I'll buy it. <laughs> I'm not sure about that. Either, but... <laughs> okay, are you still are you seeing this graphic? Yep. Yes, okay, sir. good. Okay, so now, see what Brett's was looking at was the ice front from here, basically over to the Idaho state line, which led to the creation of the Channel Scablands. And he's asking a question, how can a discharge from the ice margin create so much water here, right? Well, the same problem applies when you come over here to Montana. 
You see, once again, where is this water coming from? Is it meltwater? Is it discharging from the from the, the southern margin of the ice lobes? Well, if that's the case, then the ice has to be receding. Yeah, and why would it be receding over there and advancing right there in Idaho at the at the ice dam at the same time? At the same time, yes, yes. So and yeah, we went over the other option, which was rainfall, and it's like, well, if you have a bunch of rainfall, how do you have the ice advancing? I mean, it just right. And and you see, if you look at the different uh, categories of glaciers, they range from tempered glacier to to a cold based polar glacier. Well. Tempered glaciers are known to surge. They, they, they can accelerate their advance and, and their retreats. Um, but the thing is, is they're, they, they have water at their bottom, at the base, basal meltwater. And the basal meltwater can actually lubricate the base of the ice sheet, which allows it to accelerate its, its uh, advance. And that's called surging, right? But when you have a surging glacier, rather than just a slow-moving glacier, the problem is, is now you've got to add water to the bottom of the glacier, right? So when you add that water to the, to the glacier bottom, how do you create at the same time, simultaneously, a perfect hydraulic seal? If I go, let's see here, to, the, uh, to this graphic, and you hear, here as you can see really, to me, where the, the problem is even getting more complex. Because now in this graph, you can see Glacial Lake Missoula. You see the ice lobe, and you'll see that the ice lobe here is only filling. It stops at the southern end of Lake Pend right here. So if you apply ice marginal profile, you've got to have this ice be at least a half a mile thick when you're here blocking the westward flow of the Clark Fork River. It has to be at least a mile thick. I mean, a half a mile, right? If the water is 2,100 feet deep, the, 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 the uh, depth of the ice has to be at least 10% more than that, right? Be, at least, because otherwise the ice floats. That's the problem. But now look at this. What kind of marginal profile is going to give you a half a mile of ice from the southern terminus of Pend Array up to the position of the ice da uh, dam itself? and then. East of there, lapping, almost coming up to the bottom of the ice dam, you've got this other huge pro-glacial lake, Lake Columbia. So with Lake Columbia there, now notice the relation of Lake Columbia to the scab lands. The head of those scab land tracts coincide with that 2,400 foot above sea level topographic line, contour line that I was referring to earlier, and that is now taken as the shoreline of Lake Columbia. So now we're supposed to think that here's a situation where above the ice dam, we've got a 2,100-foot hydraulic head with basal pressures over, of over 950 pounds per square inch. And then at the toe of the ice dam, we've got a whole other body of water. But there's no hydraulic connectivity between those two bodies of water at all. So, so like what Warren Hunt was saying, he's saying even a 1,200-foot depth of water against an ice dam is an impossibility. How do you get to 2,100 feet? Is there, in fact, evidence that there is a maximum depth at which ice can retain water? And the answer is yes, there is. There's, there's theoretical studies, and we're going to get into this and look at this. We probably won't have time tonight, but there's theoretical studies that suggest around 500 feet is the maximum. But empirically, it's always much less than that. Glacial ice dam lakes fail at usually 100 to 200 foot water depth. Why? Because they, in most cases, they can percolate through the ice or between the ice bedrock interface or through the bedrock itself. And that process is going to accelerate as the, as the depth of the water increases. So we have to somehow have a, a ice be so stable that it can hold this rising ocean of water against it until that water is over 2,000 feet deep. Now you think about, well, uh, you know, 950 pounds per square inch. 950 pounds square, per square inch is uh, about 140 
thousand pounds per square foot. Now think about a block, a cubic foot of ice, a block of ice, a square foot in area, and you impose. Let me do that again to make sure that I'm right. Okay, I said about 950 pounds per square inch times 144. Yeah, it comes about 136,800. 70 tons number. per square foot. Uh, about 70 tons per square foot. Yeah, that's about right. Now, <laughs> tell me, how is that possible? <laughs> how, are, how are you going to have those kind of pressures without it completely crushing its way through that ice? I, I, Obviously, I, I it happens, so I don't know. <laughs> well, this is why we need to come back to Brett's. Yeah, we do. And, and yeah, I'm going to uh, present the information about what we can learn from looking at modern ice-dammed lakes. And I think this would be extremely valuable and that we need to do that to be able to understand what we're doing, what we're what, to, to come to some kind of an explanation for this extraordinary phenomenon of the of the Missoula floods. I'm also going to propose, uh, in the aftermath of looking at this evidence and suggesting that we have to go north to find the source of the floods, that we have to actually go up into the plateau country in the Rocky Mountains of of primarily British Columbia to find the source of of these floods. And that Lake Missoula is not the source, but is really just a secondary holding pond for water emanating from the north. If that is an idea that has merit, I'm also going to suggest that we rename these floods the Cordilleran floods. Because as long as we call them the Missoula floods, the implication is that they're being formed by the draining of Lake Missoula, right? So I'm I'm yeah. actually questioning whether Lake Missoula is uh, even real, in the sense of a being a lake rather than just like a back flood, back flood ponding temporary temporary pond ponding right yeah yeah well let's go back to two thousand one long, long enough couple of days whatever to to <laughs> lift and breach that ice dam and so the rhythmites are because during the flooding it was getting jammed up with chunks of ice and you know i mean how how do you explain the rhythmites in that model because um, it's pulsing because of debris that blocks temporary blockages and stuff yes now picture walula gap is is the i call that the gathering of the waters if the implication that we were getting into is correct and we've got multiple sources of flood water leading into pasco basin and th those floods now have, are choked with huge fragments, multiple fragments of ice. Literally, I mean, from the, from the distribution of berg mounds, it's safe to say that there were thousands of icebergs being carried into floodwaters. You probably had whole forests that were ripped up, boulders, sediment load. You had this tremendous mass of material. Now, all of this stuff is being brought down and being trying to force through Wallula Gap. Now you have to get all the way down, and you've got. If you look at the if the 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 uh, the topography of from Ulula Gap down to Portland, what you're going to see is a succession of of narrows and basins and so on. There's a major uh, for, uh, a turn to the north right there at Portland. There are many places where it would make sense that you have jams, iceberg jams, or where the material is trying to move around a corner. It's just the same phenomena that why you have to, you know, um, you know, you get log jams. When these rivers get full of logs, you're going around the corner, they'll tend to jam up. If you're going where the river's wider and it gets narrow, they might jam up. Same thing. We used to see it all the time as a kid in Minnesota when the ice on the rivers would break up. One of the things that they had to do was make sure that, the, uh, that there were not uh, jams, ice jams, particularly uh, blocking up the, where, where you had the buttresses of the rivers coming, uh, of bridges coming down into the river, right? And so and sometimes they would have to get in there and artificially bust up, sometimes even with dynamite, bust up those ice jams to get the water to flow through. Well, 
normally what will happen is you get a, a, a jam like that. And what happens then when you get a jam that's in a constriction? The water rises behind it, doesn't it? Right? Think about right. it. Yeah. Right? Well, as the water's rising, the pressure is increasing, isn't it? Now, what might normally happen is the rising of the water increases the pressure and will eventually push the, push the jam through. Um, and then what happens to the water level when, you, when the jam gets pushed through the constriction? Water level drops. Right? Now, let's suppose you've got this process repeating multiple times because now you have to get this huge flood rush all the way down from Wallula Gap all the way out to the Pacific Ocean. And so it's going to be anything but a smooth, continuous, uniform flow. That whole reach is going to be a whole series of, you know, jams and, and um, you know, things getting heaped up together, rising and falling water levels. You know, it is not going to be a smooth, uniform process. I think that what we're seeing at, at uh, places like Burlingame Canyon is simply the rising and falling of the ponded water above Wallula Gap. And basically what happens is every time the water drops below, I forgot the exact elevation. I think the elevation of, of, of um, Burlingame Gulch is about 600 feet, 700 feet above sea level. So every time the water then would rise against Wallula Gap 600 feet deep, then it fills Pasco Basin. When the water drops below 600 feet, the water drains off and leaves a layer of mud. But the water is continuing to come from the north, feeding into the north, northern reaches of Pasco Basin. So as this water continues to feed in to Pasco Basin, again, choked with icebergs and, and debris and everything, and all of that stuff has to force its way through Wallula Gap. I think that what we would be seeing is that in Pasco Basin, the water level is rising and falling, rising and falling until the final source of the flood water spigots have been turned off and the water can drain on out. And I think that that's what we're seeing in, in, in Pasco, in Walla Walla uh, Basin. I, th I think the it's rhythmic. 600 feet above uh, the water level there at Wallula Gap, not, a, not 600 feet above sea level, but 600 feet higher than Wallula Gap. Right, right. But Wallula Gap actually is not that much higher than sea level. Okay. At that point. But, okay. but yeah. So, I mean, it's definitely within the ballpark. Of, but yeah, you're right. Uh, gotcha. And for precision, that's, that's better. So that's. And then, the, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, to answer Kyle's question, I think that that's what we should be looking at and considering in terms of, of what's depositing these rhythmites. Um, Very cool. So then let's end up with, with this quote from David Alt who is a geologist up there in the Pacific Northwest who's done extensive studies of Lake Missoula. And, it, and this is in his book, Glacial Lake Missoula and its humongous floods. He poses some interesting questions, but he doesn't really answer them. But this is what he says. And given an alternative explanation like we've been talking about here, this completely supports, I think, what I've been saying. This is what he wrote in 2001. It is surprising that no one has found fossils in Glacial Lake Missoula. No petrified wood, no leaves, no bones. We have no tangible record of the plants and animals that lived in Glacial Lake Missoula or around its shores. It is especially surprising to find evidence of a great lake with no sign of fish, not even a few scales. He goes on to say, all the shorelines are very faint. Nothing suggests the violent crash of breaking waves. Trenches dug through Glacial Lake Missoula shorelines reveal precious little that looks like what we see in a trench dug through a modern beach. The lake shorelines show hardly a trace of wave depositions, hardly a pebble that the shuffling waves worked to a flattened shape. 
nor do the old lake shores include such common features as cliffs, sand spits, or deltas. So how would you then explain this utter lacking of evidence from what you would find from a normal lake? Well, I think the answer to that question is simple. It was never a lake. Not in the sense that we conceive a lake. And that's why all of you, you find, you don't find that evidence that he's, you know, is proclaiming is so conspicuously absent. Of course, there was a body of water there, but it wasn't a lake in the sense yeah, that. It was a flood. It was a flood. <laughs> it was not a lake. That's, yeah. That's what I'm getting at. And so I think we'll pick up that trend of thought with the next episode. And then. Probably will conclude for the time being uh, the, the the Missoula floods, the Cordilleran floods, but we'll see how it goes because we've got some potential guests coming up in the near future that right um, that will yeah, be. I think it needs to be Missoula slash Cordilleran from here on out. Yeah, uh, people people some people may recognize a Missoula, but yeah, it needs a needs a new. Uh, New name for it, much broader uh, source for those waters. So I think on the next episode, what we'll do is we'll really get into a major deconstruction of the ice dam. All right. Great. That sounds good. And I just got to say, it's it's a little, I don't know, it just strikes me that enormous amount of water with nothing alive in it. You know, it's just... Mm -hmm. There's nothing comparable to that today. Like any any mm. large body of water has all kinds of life, including fish and everything else. But right. Lake Missoula, well, even if it was so short lived, you gotta imagine that much water and there's nothing living in it. Right. And you know, again, I, I've shown this already. We'll 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 review it again. But you know, Brad and I made that traverse of the Bitterroot Valley, which would have been the most distal reservoir of Lake Missoula. Yeah. And you know, because of the, the 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 remote distance between that valley and the outlet, uh, there would have been a significant lag in the drawdown time. Right. And the energy levels in that distal reservoir would would be basically low. And and repeated lakes, you should have you know multiple varves very visible on the floor, filled with you know freshwater fossils, filled with evidence of fish of the life that was in the lake. You don't find that. What you find is just one frog <laughs> is what <laughs> one frog, <laughs> one frog. Yes. No, what you do find is a lot of shattered, broken rock uh, from the south to the north wow. of the valley. So we'll look at that on the next episode. So. All right. All right. Excellent. So I want to add one thing before we go, because I just want people to know again that I'm no longer associated with the Sacred Geometry International site. I receive no compensation for any of my content that's being sold there. And I want people to know that, um, I just want people to know that if you purchase something from that website, all the money is going to the administrator. None of it goes to me. Um, and he has ignored two cease and desist letters to stop uh, selling my work without remuneration to me, which he has ignored. So I think it's just time that people started understanding what's going on there um, because it's, um, it's, it's not right. What's happening. He's ripping you off is what's going on. He's totally ripping you off and trying to steal your work. And it's uh, yeah, it's bordering criminal. So, That's yeah. Awesome. And if, you know, if you're a member of the site, I would, you know, I think people need to know just the simple fact that, I receive no compensation, no remuneration for any of the sales of the CBD. I mean, the 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 DVDs with my content, the uh, you know the many video clips that are being posted there that are being monetized through um, you know advertising, any sales of classes whose content was entirely my creation. Uh, I see none of that and have not for almost three years now. So. And so, I am not, I'm also not a proponent of the all the half-baked conspiracy theories that are constantly being promoted on the social media of the Sacred Geometry International website. So just that we're clear on that. Yeah. Also. 
Good. That's yeah. Right. Thank you for stating that clearly. Um, on the positive side, uh, these, these trips in the last two months have been extraordinary. The people we've met, the contacts and, uh, the potential for what we can do in the future is so exciting. So, uh, we are doing another Scablands trip right in, uh, late September. It's over half full at this point. Uh, contact at the cabin slash Carlson, get your name on the list, get in there, have a blast with us, uh, September, uh, 20th to the 26th. And then I'm also developing, uh, we've done two Southwest tours this, this, uh, year and, uh, hoping to do two more next year. I'm developing, uh, itineraries, one out of Kanab. Uh, that would get us into Zion, get us into Bryce Canyons, get us into North uh, North Rim of the Grand Canyon. So much to see around there. And then another one that would uh, potentially be out of Durango that would be more uh, Pueblo, uh, Anasazi, uh, you know, ancient uh, archaeology in that realm. Uh, back to Mesa Verde, but also uh, Chaco Canyon, uh, Aztec ruins over into Canyons of the Ancients, all kinds of crazy awesome things to see there so uh hoping to pull off uh at least those at least those uh two trips in the southwest and two more in montana next year so uh you know pay attention and uh you can always send us an email at tours at randallcarlson.com and uh, get your get yourself on the list early yeah actually one of the scab land strips this year in september yeah yeah man that's yeah. right so um yeah what about the Cumberland tour? Is that is that still oh on that's the table? still yeah that's still on. Okay. As soon as we can get as soon as we get clearance that things are opened up enough that we can get to all the sites we want to see. Yeah. Um, without having to double down on you know masks and all of that, which I think it's pretty much opened up mostly now. But yeah, you know a lot yep. some of the sites that we want to see are state and, and federal government, which you know they're they're running this thing out as long as they can. So. Uh, yeah, so we're co- we're calling that the backyard tour. It's in Randall's backyard neighborhood, uh, Northeast Alabama and, uh, Eastern Tennessee. So that's set up for, uh, first week of November. So we still want to believe that we can pull that off and, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, you can find information on the randallcarlson.com website. And again, uh, if, if you don't find the right, uh, a uh, place to sign up right away. There's always tours at randallcarlson.com and let us know you want to go on any or all of these. There you go. And we've got some other interesting things to report. I mean, uh, yeah, some interesting things coming together around how tube, um, some incredibly awesome content creators are joining the team and we'll be talking about that. Um, we'll also be talking about some interest that's really starting to, to gel around the idea of using the, principles that we haven't been talking about much yet, but we're going to be segueing into looking at uh, ancient science, ancient architecture. Um, you know, we've been talking about the great floods and all of this, but we're going to get back to the idea of what some of these civilizations and cultures were up to throughout uh, both uh, pre anti antediluvian and post diluvian and look at some of these, uh, some of that amazing evidence for, um, some very sophisticated knowledge of how the world works. And there's some uh, growing interest in seeing a modern 21st century application of some of those principles. So we'll be sharing more about that information um, in upcoming episodes. Can't wait. Yeah. (laughs) All right, guys. Great show. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll see everybody next week. Next week. Next week. All right, beautiful. Yep. Good job, Good Randall. Night. Good night. Good, Good night. night. Thanks yeah. for joining us, Laura. Was I silent enough? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you did silent. You All did right, silent yeah. Laura very well. <laughs> <laughs> you look much better. You look much better than there Mike. <laughs> I would have to agree with that. <laughs> All right, that's what I'm here for. All right. All right, ciao.